Welcome friends, welcome family. Welcome to this celebration of life for Bertha May Worth. I am Pastor Susan Grayson, and on behalf of the members and elders of Rockville Presbyterian Church, and on behalf of Bert's family members, I welcome you to this service. May we all be showered with the Holy Spirit in our time together. Please pray with me. Eternal God, we acknowledge the uncertainty of our life on earth. We are given a mere handful of days, and our span of life seems nothing in your sight. All flesh is as grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field, and the grass withered, and the flower faded. But your word stands forever. In this is our hope, for you are our God, even in this time of passing. You are with us as we remember, as we love, as we celebrate birth. And we celebrate the life of Bertha May, wife, mother, grandmother, teacher, friend, church member, musician, artist, poet. We lift up to you all of the memories that we have of her, all of the love that we have for her. In this service of worship, shower us with that love, with that celebration. Amen. Please stand as you are able and join in amazing grace. Hear now a reading from Psalm 104 and reading from the teachings 
of Hobart Reims, who was Bert's father. William Trendinker will be giving this reading. Welcome, William. Uh, hello? Oh, yeah. Um, my grandfather's father, Hobart, taught a Bible study class to the adults of his church for more than two decades. Volumes of his work were found in my grandmother's house in Middlesbrough. Here's a short expert, uh, excerpt he wrote in January of 1965. We may not have the opportunity to be governors, presidents, or kings, but we can be every day in God's army and witnessed by our acts, our words, and our faith. What can we contribute to this world when every day is filled with opportunities? Can we ask for and expect God's blessings? Or are his blessings dependent partly on what we do? Um, here's an uh, excerpt from Psalm 104, um, line 24 uh, to 28. How many are your works, God? In wisdom you make them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, and Leviathan, which you formed to frolic there. All creatures to you, to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. Thank you. And now we will hear from Bert's beloved husband, William, better known to you all as Bill. Come on up, Bill. I think the mic's probably at the right level, yes? Okay. I'm going to read this because from time to time I've tried to be extemporaneous about things and it didn't work, so I've written it. Remembering Bert is a blessing I will always have. Bert and I met 60 years ago. We had our 56th wedding anniversary this past August 20. With her passing, my mind has been filled with hundreds of adventures, misadventures, and memories of our sharing of music, family, traveling, rejoicing, loss, and moments of simply experiencing our lives together. And these memories begin in 1962. Bert had recently graduated from Carson Newman University in Tennessee. She had been a music major seeking a degree in music education and piano performance, <clears throat> which she attained with outstanding grades. Bert was also an excellent student of academics and consistently earned honors. Following graduation, she moved to Washington, D.C. area to accept a job in teaching. I was finishing my senior year at the University of Maryland with a major in engineering after studying for two years at the American University with the intent of going into medicine. Throughout my college years, I worked part-time in grocery stores. I owe my good fortune for meeting Bert to having worked part-time in grocery stores. We met at a store named Jumbo Grocery that was the name Jumbo, <laughs> and no one's heard of it yet. Um, and it was there that we had our first sort of date, which was after working sitting on a large pile of bags of peat moss, which were stacked in front of the store, and which were, and which we credit with ultimately bringing us together for a marriage of 56 wonderful years. It was there it began. 
Part of my work at Jumbo was to do the books in the office. The boss figured I could count because I was an engineering student. <laughs> I had to agree. One evening from my office perch, I spotted a beautiful young woman who appeared to be searching for something. I considered it my responsibility to assist her. So I acted. She said that she was looking for a flower to wear for a date she had with a dentist that evening. My first reaction was mild disappointment. But my duties to my job prevailed and my interest did not wane and soon we were engaged in conversation and I learned that she was a pianist and taught music in a public school. This was important information. From that point on, I was always on the lookout for her in the store. And several days later, she appeared. And after work, we found ourselves sitting on stacked bags of peat moss outside the store, talking about music and exchanging information about ourselves. I learned that evening that meeting, that of that meeting, there's something I wrote here <laughs> that wouldn't make sense if I read it. <laughs> I learned that evening that Pete Moss can act as a catalyst for love. <laughs> Although that benefit is not noticed on the out, noted on the outside of the Pete Moss bags. <laughs> Soon we were meeting off in our first date during my lunch break was having lunch at a Chinese restaurant. She was delightful, intelligent, and knowledgeable about music. I should add that during our marriage, we continued to use peat moss, but for other less romantic purposes. <laughs> Bert was truly a dedicated teacher. She taught her students all aspects of music, harmony, the musical scales, the merits of various types of music and instruments, and piqued their interest in this wonderful form of human communication. Many of her students have returned to see her again, sometimes years later, to thank her for having brought a deep understanding of music into their lives. Some have successfully pursued careers in music, theater, and performance. Bert eagerly put herself into her teaching and taught her students the importance and merits of all forms of music. Most of Bert's teaching career was at Christ Episcopal School, a great school here in Rockville. For 28 years, she deeply involved her students in many aspects of social interaction, cooperation, responsibility, and hard work, and the creation of music and theater. She made music an important part of their education. She loved her jobs and the students she taught, and they loved her. For decades, Bert sang with the Washington Choral Arts Society. Most of choral arts performances were at the Kennedy Center. Bert had a beautiful alto voice and on occasion was selected by the director, Norman Scribner, to perform a short solo. Often following a performance, members of choral arts would meet at a member's home to celebrate and socialize. Leonard Bernstein was sometimes in attendance. At one such get-together following a concert conducted by Bernstein, Lenny put aside his glass of scotch. I have it on good authority that that's what he drank, even at this event. <laughs> and invited Bert to dance, and of course she accepted this, his invitation. She considered this one of the highlights of her singing career. <laughs> I had previously met Bernstein backstage a couple of times. We talked about some of his performances and recordings. He did not ask me to dance. <laughs> Otherwise, he was very engaging. I regard people far less by what they say and much more by what they do. What did Bertha May do while she was with us? In a variety of ways, she gave all of herself to her family, her friends, her students, strangers, the sick, the homeless and hungry, 
her church, her parents, her daughter and grandchildren, and to me. God has blessed me to have had her as my wife, mother to our daughter, grandmother to our grandchildren, and dearest friend for a lifetime of sharing all the facets of life. That's it. And now please stand as you are able and we will sing together How Great Thou Art.
Please be seated. Now we will have a reading from the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes from Bert's granddaughter, Amelia Evelina Denker. Hello. <laughs> generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. And now we will hear remembrances from Bert's daughter, Lee Worth Denker. Dad, and I, I did not hear your eulogy, so you're going to be a tough act to follow. <laughs> On November 13th, God gently took the hand of my mother and led her from this life to the next. And your messages of condolences came through emails, texts, Facebook, and letters. And as I was reading them, I noticed what wonderfully colorful adjectives you used to describe her. <laughs> and they were so uplifting. Unique, creative, joyful, elegant, spunky, loving, faithful, vibrant, industrious, resourceful, strong, talented, dedicated, indefatigable, quirky, whimsical, beautiful, selfless. My mother was the only child born to Bertha May Ho and William Hobart Reams in the small town of Middlesbrough, Kentucky, in Cumberland Gap, surrounded by the Appalachian Mountains. Mom's tall, dashing father, Hobart, was a man of many talents and innate kindness, creativity, and godliness. He was an actor, amateur photographer, and he taught Bible study class to groups within his church. He was born in Kentucky and attended college in Oregon, and he owned Reams Lumber Company, located in a wonderful Art Deco building. Mother Burt as my mother's mother was called, was a petite, dark-haired local beauty. She was one of two daughters and five sons of James Roland Ho, who owned and operated J.R. Ho and Sons Iron Foundry, a business that continues its growth and success to this day. Mother Bert earned a music degree, <laughs> no surprise, from college, and she was an accomplished pianist and organist. And Bertha and Hobart were madly in love. And in 1924, the ages of 22 and 24, they married, and their wedding was literally a media event. The local paper in Middlesbrough even covered it in their society page. <laughs> and they were deeply committed to starting a family. And since Hobart owned the local lumber yard and he had an eye for building, he envisioned a warm and wonderful stone house for them to live in Middlesbrough. And he built that house on a cozy but steep wooded hill on Edgewood Court overlooking the First Baptist Church, where Bertha May was the organist. And in the backyard, she had a garden of red rose bushes that grew across the top of the hill, and they lined the path from the house down to her church. And the house on Edgewood Court remained in our family for 85 years, and it felt like home to mom and a second home to me. For 15 years, Hobart and Bertha May longed for a child that never came, and then when she was 37, my mother's mother received the best of God's gifts. She was carrying a child. And on December, 20, December 29th, I know my mother's birthday, September 29th, 1939, that child came into this world, a beautiful, strawberry blonde baby girl, my mother. 
and a few days later, my mother's mother died. And in despair, Hobart retreated to the house he built for them, and my infant mother was left at Middlesbrough General Hospital in the care of nurses for three weeks until Hobart brought her home, hired a full-time nanny, and that's the story as my mother told it. We're gathered here to talk about my mother and celebrate her life, but here I am sitting here talking about my grandparents. But I wanted, I felt like she wanted me to share some of the stories that she told me. She told me very little. But the generations that come before us are important and they shape us. It's what we're born from. And so I'd just like to tell you a little bit about them. Mom was a person who did not focus on herself or her own needs or talk about herself. She was a doer. She was always helping others and she was using hands-on skills to help those around her make the best out of themselves. And she got this from her parents. And there was a lot of love as she grew up in the house on Edgewood Court. And uh, her father, Hobart, he was an excellent photographer and he built a dark room in the house and his little daughter was her, his favorite subject. <laughs> As a baby girl and little girl, little Bert was taken under the wing of Louisa Ho, her mother's cousin, a gorgeous redhead and a pianist and opera singer. <laughs> Louisa taught mom to sing and play and treated her like the child she never had. And as a little girl, mom wished for a mother like the other little girls had in school. And she thought Louisa would be her mother. I have many fond memories of us together at Louisa's home in Middlesbrough, singing, then playing the piano, having tea, playing with the Siamese cats. And even at a young age, my mother was inclined to behave in a thoroughly authentic manner. She was true to her nature. Her elementary school was just down the hill, and in first grade, she was allowed to walk herself to school. She would run, skip, and sometimes she just walked backwards. And each day, she walked past a large Victorian house that rented rooms, one to Miss Evelyn Suttle, a young lady with a business education degree. World War II was raging across Europe, and Evelyn joined the effort by folding bandages, and across the table sat a tall, handsome man, a widower, she later learned, and the father of the funny little girl who trotted past her house every day. Hobart and Evelyn had a whirlwind courtship, and they were married, and that little girl finally had someone to call mother. Evelyn adopted my mother, and she instilled discipline and high expectations, and Hobart, endless time, creativity, and cultural experiences. And it was a family dynamic that worked. Hobart and Evelyn's contrasting yet complementary forces as parents focused my mother's education and purpose. She became highly accomplished in high school and won a Who's Who National High School Achievement Award, multiple awards of excellence in English and writing. She was a speech writer who presented speeches condemning segregation, a mindset which she learned from her father. And one of my father, mother, mother's speeches on the topic won a local competition. She was invited to present it at the finals in California. The family of three planned a road trip all the way to Kentucky to California for my mother to present her speech. Mom became a highly acclaimed, welcome, <laughs> pianist. And she played solos at events around town. Her father, Hobart, was also a friend of the people of the Cherokee Nation and especially close with a man called Moses Owl, who mom vividly remembered throughout her life. And guided by Moses Owl, she and her dad had no problem getting their hands dirty in a quest to uncover ancient Cherokee arrowheads, and their collection is still in the family. At 18, mom entered Carson Newman College. Her sweet mate was Joe Blankenship and became her lifelong friend. And according to Joe, mom always got the lead roles in all the productions. <laughs> and she was very beautiful to watch on stage. But away from Middlesbrough, mom's quirky spontaneity turned into a tiny bit of a wild streak her freshman year in college. The fraternity boys were planning a panty raid on her sorority. And the only way for the boys to get in is if someone unlocked the front door from the inside. I can just imagine mom getting swept away in the theatrics of it all. <laughs> so on the plan night, she snuck down and unlocked the front door. The boys rushed in, the panty raid ensued, and it was a night she would never forget because the house matron found out. 
<laughs> and of course, Mother Evelyn was furious. She was sent home for a month from school. And according to her friend Joe, for the rest of her time at Carson Newman College, my mom clung firmly to her studies. And when her friends went to parties on the weekend, she stayed in her dorm and she studied. <laughs> After graduating from college, she moved to the DC metro area and rented a room from a warm and welcoming Italian woman who would cook wonderful meals and give mom's first small pet, a hamster, long spaghetti noodles that he would stuff in his cheek pouches. And in 1964, she started her first position as a music teacher at Bladensburg High School. She met a lot of friends there. Mom student Nancy Painter remembers her as, quote, a vibrant young teacher who got the students doing all kinds of fun new things. She revamped the school's traditional chorus into the folk singers, freed their reserved choral personas, and she got them moving and singing spirituals and folk songs straight from their hearts, and she costumed them all in long floral 1960s granny dresses. <laughs> Mom could never resist a costuming opportunity. In her first year's teaching, she learned to uncover the best attributes of each student and select music that suited them. Nancy Painter remembers her as a teacher who watched over her students in the classroom and out. That never altered. In 1962, she met Bill. He liked her sweet southern drawl, and she liked his wicked sense of humor. And they had a love of classical music in common, and it was a match, for better or for worse and in sickness, and in health. The day before their wedding in 1966, Dad rolled down Middlesbrough's main drag in his late model Mustang convertible with his best friend Kumar Kishinchand. They pulled up to the local barber so that Dad could get a trim. And inside, more locals were just hanging out and shooting the breeze than there were customers getting haircuts. Dad sat in the chair, and the barber casually questioned the new guy in town. So, what brings you here to Middlesbrough, he asked. I'm getting married, Dad replied. And the barber asked, who are you marrying? He said, Bertha May. And the barber exclaimed, you must be Bill. <laughs> All the locals were on him in a flash, shaking his hand and congratulating him. It's a small town. I love it. The next day, just hours before my parents' wedding at the First Baptist Church, Mom was busy getting ready with her friends at the house when Hobart pulled her aside and requested they go for a drive to have a private moment. Hobart drove quietly just up the road and stopped at the cemetery gates. They stepped out of the car, scaled the small grassy hill covered with well-kept gravestones, and stopped at the top. She was seeing her mother Bert's grave for the first time, and she was 28. Weeping, Hobart told his daughter how proud his birth mother would have been of her and how alike they were. And throughout her life, she never knew much about her birth mother. Photos of her were stored away, her things removed, memories kept deeply buried. And later in life, mom would reflect on this very deeply. She would say, my mother was erased, and I never dared ask why. Yet there she was on the happiest of days, swept up the hill by her weeping father to discover the deep sorrow that he never revealed. Both sorrow and joy, they can be experienced together. It was a shocking and profound moment for her. So after their wedding, Bert and Bill moved to a tiny original 1830s wood frame house she learned from her mother-in-law, Amelia, how to find bargains on antiques, and from her father-in-law, how to refinish those antiques. <laughs> on the night I was born, mom and dad had joined a nice Chinese dinner at a Chinese restaurant with Bing and Bobby Chang, and they shared one of those, those gigantic Chinese cocktails for two, <laughs> the ones with the little paper umbrellas. It was different times back then. And my birth happened quickly and without incident. And in a day, my mom was back home with me. The house flooded with so many unexpected guests that she handed the baby over, went into the kitchen, and whooped up a huge spaghetti dinner for everybody. <laughs> a couple of weeks later, mom and dad put me in the car, drove to Middlesbrough, and surprised her parents with their new baby. And a few months after that, Hober died of a massive heart attack. Joyful times and sorrowful times. They can exist at the same time. 
Mom and Dad made a cozy home in Hyattsville until November of 1972 when they moved into their new home on Hornbeam Drive. And for 50 years, my mom and dad enjoyed a lively home, inviting friends over for their big parties, the annual New Year's Day pork and black eyed pea party, groaning board parties, the opera masquerade costume party, and every invitation was in the form of a poem she wrote with one of her amusing little drawings. And when guests walked through the door of one of mom's and dad's parties, they were greeted in the foyer by this huge pile of punch on a table. It was ginger ale, frozen orange juice concentrate, frozen strawberries, and a giant jug of wine. Maura, you were asking about that earlier. <laughs> That's the recipe. The parents would usher all the little kids into the basement right away, which was unfinished at the time, but it had a lot of toys, a metal slide, a swing on ropes attached directly to the floor joists above, a tricycle, a wagon, a ride on horses with springs, and lots of boxes and stuff. All over a vast and very hard concrete floor. <laughs> the place was a death trap, and somehow, we always made it out alive. Mom had a talent for imbuing ordinary party food with her own personal flair. She didn't just bake bread. She turned it into sculpture. She was the Michelangelo of loaves. <laughs> From dough, she would sculpt mermaids, Adam and Eve in the garden, buxom ladies and brawny men, and then leave the dough sculptures to rise near the stove until they were ready to bake. More often than not, when she pulled one of her creations out of the oven, it would send her laughing into hysterics because the parts of the ladies and gentlemen had either migrated where they should not be or grown enormous. As some of you may know, Halloween was a chance for mom to put on a little show. And when the little kids came to the door and said, trick or treat, she gave them both. But to get the treat, you had to pass through the eye of the needle and confront your fear. One year, the door lay open and the little kids came in. It was dark, eerie music played from the speakers and candles were everywhere. And in the living room on the long bench lay a figure, a witch, shrouded in a dark dress, clutching a bowl of candy. And to get to the candy, the kids had to walk up and reach in, and as soon as their hands got into the bowl, mom quickly lurched up and shrieked, and the kids ran straight out the door. Another Halloween, mom sat at the piano dressed like an old gypsy, improvising an eerie melody as the kids cautiously creeped in. They remembered what happened the year before. <laughs> And in the opposite corner of the room sat a figure in an old rocking chair holding the bowl of candy. And the kids couldn't tell if it was a real person or not. But what they didn't know is that mom had the rocking chair rigged to one of the pedals of the piano. <laughs> and as the children neared the bowl, mom would press the pedal while she played, causing the chair to creak back and forth, back and forth, sending the kids straight out the door again. If they were not either crying or screaming, it was not a success. <laughs> Mom's best friend on Hornbeam Drive was Missy Mooney, who lived next door. They were both witty, unique women and kindred spirits. It was the kind of friendship where you could just walk straight into the other person's house to grab some eggs or just say hi and have a coffee. In fact, they visited each other so often, a path was worn into the ground among the trees between their two houses. Mom called it the love path, as it was a tangible representation of the love between our two families. Missy had great recipes that she'd share with mom. Mom, on the other hand, was an improvisational cook. She could open the refrigerator, grab almost everything in it, and whip up a gourmet meal in 25 minutes. She made up words for cooking, frazzle, that's when you fry chicken in a really hot iron skillet. Foof, that's whipped cream. Kitchen sink soup, that's when you pull all the stuff out of the fridge. You don't know what to do with it, so you chop it up, toss it in a pot with water and bouillon cubes, bring it to a boil, and voila, kitchen sink soup, because it included everything but the kitchen sink. It looked terrible, but it tasted great. Mom sang and performed her whole life, 
She sang as an alto with the Choral Arts Society. She acted in countless plays at Cedar Lane Stage, the Roundhouse, all while teaching music during the day. And she usually toted her little daughter around while attending rehearsals at night. Sometimes I would get lost in a building or fall asleep somewhere where she couldn't find me. I think then she decided I should be in the production so she could keep an eye on me. And when she was at the Kennedy Center, she got me cast in Mozart's Desauberflute in the Opera House. I was only a lion, and I only got the job because I was small enough to fit in the costume. I played one of two lions that sat around during the Queen of the Night's aria. Maurice Sendak painted a magical backdrop for that production, and when Mom saw him walking down the hallway backstage, she grabbed the first piece of paper she could find, a small envelope, and she asked him to autograph it, and he drew a little lion sketch on it, and he wrote, To Lee from Maurice Sendak. I treasure that Mom did that for me. We are in a few musicals together at the Roundhouse Montgomery College Summer Dinner Theater, where she gave a wondrously melodramatic performance as Eulalie Shin, the mayor's wife. <laughs> in 1980, mom and dad turned the lower level of the house into a music room where she taught piano. Worth Piano Studio was appointed with two Steinway Grand Pianos, and one of them was a 100-year-old concert ground found in utterly unplayable condition. Dad rebuilt that Steinway in the back of the basement using original Steinway parts. And when the piano was finished, it was a work of beauty and tonal excellence. And my mother loved it playing it every day and teaching her students on it. They began to host competitors of the prestigious William Capel Piano Competition. The first was Arthur Green, who won the competition that year with a passionate rendition of Brahms in B-flat. And the next was Fred Chu, who a few years later recorded the complete solo piano works of Prokofiev. Mom held fun holiday-themed piano recitals for her students and their families and was so excited to reward them afterwards with a fun reception of cookies and goodies. Mom's time at Christ Episcopal for 28 years brought her immense satisfaction. There she met teachers and parents who would become lifelong friends. The Fitzpatricks, Mayburgers, Donna Diamond, Joan Skoda, Ledbetters, Kitsulises, the Waldens, Dixons, Tyras. She created a stellar music program that expanded in scope and creativity throughout the years. She had the traditional choir, the special choir, and each spring transformed the sanctuary into a theater, producing and directing musicals like Oklahoma, Music Man, and Dragon Tales. And she took great care to cast each student in the perfect role. She designed amazing costumes. One of the most impressive is an enormous colorful dragon with red lights for eyes and a long sweeping body. And it required one student to be the head and four or five to climb under the body to make it sweep around the stage. She also started a dinner theater at the school that students organized and ran themselves. She took a course at George Mason University and got certified to teach Orff's shul work. By the time she left Christ Episcopal, she had built a comprehensive music education plan tailored to each stage of a child's education, kindergarten through eighth grade. And it is no surprise that many of her students continued their music study, many achieving degrees in music and entering professional careers. And all while doing that, she managed to attend this church for decades, sing in the choir, play in the bell choir, teach the kids choir with her good friend Ray Washu, and even painted an entire hallway in the adjoining building with a spectacular mural of the followers of Jesus in the town of Jerusalem. And here she met wonderful friends. She visited Middlesbrough many times to stay close with Mother Evelyn, who passed away in 2013, just two days after Mom and I had left. Mom decided to sell the house her father built. We fixed it all up and loaded up the U-Haul truck. Mom and I walked around the outside of the house one last time. In the backyard by the cliff was a single red rose blooming from the nearly bare twigs of a small bush. And with tears in her eyes, my mother said, Mother Bert's rose. And I opened the U-Haul, pulled out a shovel, and dug the rows. And once I started digging, I realized that as small as it was on the surface, the roots were strong. Alex and I planted Mother Bert's rose in our front garden, where it wove itself into our magnolia tree. Animals love mom. 
She had weimaraners, canaries, and was always thrilled with animals I would spontaneously arrive home with, mostly French lop rabbits and Maine Coon cats. In the 1980s and 90s, mom's typical morning routine began by sitting on the family room couch with her coffee, watching the news, one foot stroking a dog lying at her feet, one hand stroking a huge rabbit on one side of the couch beside her, and the other scratching a cat on the other side. She spoke a language that animals understood. And these past three years, mom was comforted by the cat Amelia and I adopted for her, who would sleep on her bed, lie in her lap, or stretch out on the top of her reclining chair with one paw gently on her shoulder. Mom loved her grandchildren, and one day her oldest, Mason, discovered a guitar under her living room couch, and after teaching him a few chords, she quickly ran out and bought him his first guitar. Her granddaughter, Amelia, could vocalize melodies before she could speak, and this made her very happy, and she taught Amelia piano until she went away at, to study ballet at age 16. Mom's youngest child, grandchild, William, also played, and when she came to the heartbreaking conclusion to close her piano studio because of her illness, she still taught him faithfully. William was still quite young when she could no longer teach him, her last student. And when he was 12, as they sat together on the piano bench, she carefully explained to him that she had dementia. One of mom's last ventures to the theater was this past May when she was invited downtown to see actor, singer, theatrical producer, and former student of Christ Episcopal, Brandon Victor Dixon, host the inaugural season of the uh, award ceremony named in honor of him for excellence in high school musical theater. Mom treasured the Dixon family, including Brandon's brother, Craig, and mother, Lorna, who's another creative soul like mom. When mom was still well, she was overjoyed when Brandon and his family invited her to New York to see him in opening night of Motown, the musical. Mom's disease progressed rapidly over the past few years, and we found Mary, a beautiful soul who made it possible. Mary, are you here? I'm Mary. Who made it possible for mom to stay in her home of 50 years. Mary lived with and cared for mom for two years. And in the beginning, they would sing hymns together while mom played along. Last month, when she was taken to the hospital, we were told that she would not make it. And the whole family was crying by her side. Dad, Alex, Mason, Nancy, Barry, my friend Grace. We were playing classical music. And Nancy put on Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto softly near her ear. And mom rallied just for a moment. And her weak arms raised up as if to conduct. And she whispered something. My friend Grace, a musician, heard it, what she whispered. She said, D minor. <laughs> Rachmaninoff's third is in the key of D minor. Music was her first language and her last, and her soul thrived on it. Mom passed away at Casey House Hospice on a cold, breezy morning, and the trees had lost most of their leaves. And after we said our final goodbyes, I drove home, stepped out of the car, and there, in my wintry garden, a bright red color caught my eye. It was one single red rose blooming. Mother Burt's rose. If the angels of our loved ones find a way to speak with us, perhaps they speak to us through nature. And perhaps the rose that bloomed for me that day is my mother telling us that her spirit will always be looking out for us, the ones she has loved. Thank you for that beautiful tribute, Lee. And next we have a musical tribute from Brandon Victor Dixon, who 
was a student of Bert's for many years and is uh, now a singer and actor and carrying on all of the lessons that he learned from here right in, in Rockville. Thank you for being with us today, Brandon. Hello, everybody. I uh, just wanted to share a few things before I share the music. Um, I'm Brandon Victor Dixon. I'm a, a student of Mrs. Worth's. She uh, was my music teacher first through eighth grade. And she is responsible for the fact that we performed three musicals a year. She's responsible for the fact that the seventh and eighth graders did a Shakespeare play uh, every year. Um, and she taught me piano as well. She also taught me how to be a generous and kind artist. Uh, and I'm grateful that I am a professional artist. I'm gonna brag a little bit actually. I have been, I've starred in over seven Broadway shows. I've been nominated for two Tony Awards two Grammy Awards, an Emmy Award. I've produced television shows, musicals, and plays. My production company, I share with my brother, is named after Mrs. Worth. Its first film comes out next year. These are my dreams. And she made them come true. The other things I dreamed about as a little kid and she gave me all of it. I will forever be endlessly grateful to her for what she has done for me and what I know she's done for somebody. Um, the song I decided to sing is from a production that she put together. We didn't actually do a, a show this time. She put together kind of a review. Uh, it was a, a production of her own making. And she asked me to sing, to sing a song in it from Sesame Street called It's Not That Easy Being Green. I don't remember why she asked me to sing it. <clears throat> uh, my mother actually made a, a Kermit the Frog costume for me to wear and I, I wore it and I sang it. Um, and so I, I thought it would be appropriate to share today. It, it stood out for me. So uh, let's, let's hit it, John. <laughs> It's not that easy being green Having to spend each day the color of the leaves When I think it could be so much nicer Being red, yellow or gold Or something much more colorful like that It's not that easy being green it seems you blend in with so many other ordinary things And people tend to pass you over Because you're not standing out like flashy sparkles in the water Or stars in the sky But green is the color of spring And oh Green can be cool and friendly like Green can be big like an ocean Or important like a mountain Or tall like a tree mm -hmm. When green is all there is to be It could make you wonder why, but Why wonder? Why wonder? I'm green and it'll do fine because I'm beautiful and I think it's what I want to be. Yes, green is the color of spring. Oh, and green can be cool and friendly like. Oh, it can be big like an ocean. Or important like a mountain Or tall like a tree yeah, yeah. When green is all there is to be It could make you wonder why But why wonder 
Why wonder I'm green and it'll define Cause it's beautiful And I think it's what I want to be These are happy tears I'm grateful I'm very grateful Thank you John Grateful Praise God, praise God for musical gifts and for that, for that talent. Thank you for that, Brandon. I did not know Bert. She passed before I came to this church. I am fairly new here, only been here since June. But over the weeks of talking with Lee and helping to plan this service and praying together and looking at some of the family's memorabilia together, I feel like I knew Bert. And what I know from being here and being a part of this service, and what a blessing that has been, is that she was a force. She was a force. She was a force. And it's very hard, I think, when someone like that is no longer physically present with us. It can feel like, how is this possible that such a person could no longer be with us? And I think it could make us challenge our idea of life and eternity and God and faith and all things spiritual and things worldly. We know that Bert was a woman of faith and that she lived out her faith in many different ways and not just by being a churchgoer. She lived out her faith by introducing the world to beauty in all of its different forms, the beauty of entertainment and charm, the beauty and the warmth of hospitality, the beauty of teaching children, the beauty of giving a grandson his first guitar. And that is a beautiful person, and that is a person who is a force. And my experience as a minister and, and talking with and being present with people who have lost a loved one is that they and we, I include myself in this, can become childlike. Childlike, no matter what our age, we can become childlike and facing that loss and wondering where are they? Where are they? And, and any good preacher or priest or theologian can give you all kinds of answers about eternity and the soul and the afterlife. And you can still be left wondering, but really, but really, where are they, right? And this, friends, this is where the rubber meets the road with faith and with mystery and with the unknown and with the heavenly realm that is beyond this realm. Now, I don't know what Bert thought about the afterlife, but I believe it was probably something like this, that we believe it is glorious. We believe that it is eternal and that we believe it is something beyond our, our wildest imagination, right? And for a woman like Bert, whose life was filled with artistry and humanity and, and discipline and love and creative expression, right? Those are, those are the things that made her up eternally, internally, eternally, right? We've heard a lot about the things that she did, the productions, the music lessons, the parties. And in each of those things that she did, we learn a lot about who she was internally. And those of you on this front row right here, her family members, you are the ones who truly knew who Bert was internally, who was she was on the quiet nights when the party guests had left. You know who she was. 
And that is her soul. That is all of our souls, right? Who we are internally inside when we are alone. That is the soul and that is what lasts forever and ever. And we don't know how. We don't know how that can be, right? It is the mystery that we live into. Friends, I encourage you, you lovers of Burtworth, you students, you friends, you children, grandchildren, son-in-law, husband of Burtworth, you knew her soul. And I would bet that if I were to ask each one of you to come up with one or two words that would describe your experience of her, that it will probably be some of the words we've already heard here tonight. But there's probably one or two of those words that reaches deeper into you than other words that you've heard of her. And I would encourage you to become part of Bert's soul by taking those words unto yourself, into your own soul, incorporating them into your own lives, into the way that you live, the way you approach life, the way you treat other people. And that, that friends, that is how Bert is alive, both in the heavenly realm, in the afterlife, and in this earthly realm. There are lots of things that people think about the divine realm, the heavenly realm. Preachers will tell you all kinds of things and they will sound so sure, right? Some people will say that you rest in God's arms or that there is a pearly gate or that you get to see all the loved ones who've gone before you and boy, it is beautiful to think that Bert is with her mother, her father, the mother who adopted her. What we know, what I believe for sure, is that it is something indescribable and that it is peace and that it is comfort and that it is joy and more than anything that it is a sense of completion, a sense of wholeness that this woman who lived her life beginning as a motherless child in a hospital for three weeks, who grew into a child who was talented and knowledgeable and energetic, and then grew into a woman who fell in love and lived out that love and honed her talents and built a family and was part of a community and was part of a teaching community and had friends who were so deeply in love with her that they were family. This woman who went from that motherless child to this woman who had richness of spirit. And then dementia. Dementia and decline. And I know that there were those of you sitting here who were close to her in her years and months of decline and dementia. And you could probably speak to the trials, the problems, the challenges, the heart break of that. And you could probably also speak to perhaps some gifts, some preciousness, some sweetness, right? There can be sweetness in those years of decline and aging. And they can be a gift from God. But it is a hard, hard transition, friends. So in this moment together tonight, I hope that you feel the spirit of divinity raining upon you and the beautiful words you have heard, the glorious music and the wonderful prayers and the scripture. Know that in coming together to celebrate Bert in this way, we are part of her wholeness. We are a part of her becoming complete in her faith, complete in her witness to God, and we are a part of keeping her soul alive. Let us do that, friends. 
let us honor, love, and celebrate her in that way. Amen. Amen. Now we will hear a reading from Psalm 23 from the grandson who received that guitar, Mason Alexander Denker. Mason, you can say a few words if you want. Thanks. Hello. The number of things I learned from my grandmother were innumerable, and I know for a fact that she's in heaven right now. And I know this because she told it to me, that it was real. And she was the only member of my family that we had this deep spiritual collect with. And I know this because I found God through my music. She saw God in the music, and she passed that down onto me. And that has transformed my life to this day. And I they, they talk about the guitar. I loved her so much. And she will always be with me every time I hear those pieces of music. And that she helped me with. She taught it to me. And my entire life, I'll have this gift. And maybe I can pass that on to my own kids one day. And I think we can pass it on together. So thank you all so much. This is a good psalm reading. And um, it's beautiful. And I hope that it um, touches you the way it touches me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me in all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thank you. Amen. 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 Thank you for that, Mason. And now I would like to invite the students. If you are a student of Bert Worth, and I think a student in any form, we'd like to invite you to come to the front and sing. Yes, John? Oh, yes, we have the bird song first. And, uh, it's appropriate because it's the same words we just heard in music. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Now enjoy the bird song. Maybe a little higher. Thank you. Is that good? Okay. That's good. Thank you. Well, I haven't been nominated for any Emmys, but. <laughs> Except, uh, but my my um, my son was one of her students, and so I had the pleasure of being in that basement for many days for performances and being close to the family. Um, and there were other connections as well through theater. Um, and so now I'll, it's an honor to sing the words that Mason so beautifully read. The Lord is my shepherd, therefore shall to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley 
the shadow of death I will fear no evil For thou art with me Thy rod and thy staff They comfort me Amen. So beautiful. And now I would like to invite the students, if you were a student of Bert, please come forward and bring your lyrics to the In the Garden. We would like to ask the students come up and lead us in singing this piece. And you should have received a lyric sheet when you walk in, a lyric sheet for In the Garden. Come on up, the Dixon Brothers. Don't be shy. The family would love for you to do this. And you know, the grandkids, I know your grandmother taught you to sing, right? Please stand as you are able.
mother's favorite song that she had played at her parents' funeral. So. Beautiful. Thank okay. you for that, Lee. Thank you all so much for coming <laughs> up. Please be seated. Friends, as we close out this service, I invite you to join me in a litany of dedication. I will say words of dedication, and I invite you to respond, hear us, O Holy One. Good and gracious God, our Bert has gone from us. We pray to you, Jesus Christ, and we remember that you said, I am the resurrection and the life. You consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Console us now. Hear us, O Holy One. Draw near to us, God. Draw near to all who mourn for Bert. Dry the tears of those who weep. Hear us, O Holy One. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us now as we weep for Bert. Hear us, O Holy One. You raise the dead to life. We ask that you give eternal life to Bert. Hear us, O Holy One. You promised paradise to the repentant thief, and we know that you bring paradise and the joys of heaven to Bert. Hear us, O Holy One. Bert was washed in baptism, anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give her the fellowship with all your saints. Hear us, O Holy One. She was nourished at your table on earth, Welcome her to your table in the heavenly kingdom. Hear us, O Holy One. Comfort us in our sorrows now at the time of death. God, I especially lift up to you, Lee and her family, Bill, as his beloved Bert is no longer with him. We ask that he would know your strength your comfort and encouragement, and in times of grief, we ask that you would send him a warm presence, a friend, a card. We ask that you would send him the knowledge of your presence and the knowledge of Bert's everlasting love for him. God, we lift up to you Bert's grandchildren, she was a beloved grandmother to them, and we see her alive in all three of them. We ask, God, that you would enter into their hearts and give them strength and help them to know your presence in a very real way in these days and months and weeks and years of loss, moving on in life without her. God, we lift up to you all of the family, all of the friends, all the people, the neighbors, the students, the colleagues, the people with whom Bert was so closely bonded. And we ask, God, in their grief that you would shower them with your Holy Spirit and the knowledge of her soul living in eternity. We ask all of this in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Friends, leave this place knowing that you have been blessed by the spirit of birth and know that she is with you, alive in you, with you through the holiness of the eternal realm ever after. Amen.
I'm sorry. All the students were supposed to come to the front for that one, but that was just a little mishap. Mom always loved to sing along. We watched our wedding video the other night, and at the end, she was having the whole party have a sing-along of The Music Man, which Brandon starred in and did a fantastic job. I still know it. I still know it. We're right here in River City.